through for the delay here. I want to welcome you all to the Heartland Institute and the Andrew Breitbart Freedom Center tonight. Heartland Institute is a 33-year-old company. Right? We are a think tank that does things a little differently. We like to focus on state issues, even though we're a national think tank. On your table, you'll see some of the things we do. We have budget and tax news, healthcare news, environment and climate news, and the most important is school reform news. And that's why y'all are here tonight to talk about education. Our fifth center that we don't actually have a newspaper for is Constitution Reform. But every week they're getting one of our newspapers. So we're affecting the legislation for, for our free market purposes every single week across the country. Over here to my left and your right is the Michael Perry Mazur Library. You're welcome to take a tour, find a staff member, we'll give you a tour of our library. We have now over 11,000 volumes of books in there, and we are officially part of the Illinois Rails um, library system now. So, and we're always, always looking for new donations for different books. Actually, Carl Lambrick brought us about 15 boxes of books tonight, so we'll have a lot more books going into our library. Eventually, I'm afraid this space is going to get taken up by books, but we'll see. That'll be a good problem to have. <laughs> you can actually come in during the day when we're here, the staff is here, and actually sit down and read some of the books. We actually have a reading space in our library, so feel free to stop by when we're working and come check out some books in there. All different topics. We actually have a, online, you can actually, from our website, you can actually see what books we have. If you want to take a look first to find out what's here, or just come browse. So, without too much delay, I want one more thing in the back, at uh, the back table, if you haven't pre-bought your books, books will be for sale at the end of the night, we have a, still have a few left. Everything we do here is complimentary for these meetings, but we do have a dip jar in the back where you can just dip your credit card in and donate $10. On your table, there's actually an envelope if you'd rather write a check, feel free to do so. We put these events on for free. But you're always welcome to help Heartland and help our mission to put on more events like this, but also to help the mission, the newspapers and all the other publications that we do. Everything on your table is free. If you want a copy of it, pick it up. If you want additional copies, you want to pass them out in your neighborhood, let us know. There's plenty of copies over here on the left. If they're out of something, let me know or another staff member know and we'll be glad to get you more copies. So Alex is finally here, thankfully. <laughs> Thankfully, here after all the weather delays, Alex is an international journalist. He has a degree in journalism from the University of Florida. He actually teaches economics to high school students through Freedom Project Education. I want to give a shout out to Freedom Project Education. They actually have a live review, remote viewing party tonight going on up in Appleton, Wisconsin. So he's lived on four different continents, and he wrote this book, Crimes of the Educators, with... Samuel Blumenfeld. Unfortunately, Samuel Blumenfeld passed away last year. But I'd like to welcome Alex to the stage. He will give us a nice presentation. If you have questions, make sure to write them down. And we will have a Q&A as well at the end of his presentation. So give Alex a round of applause. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's such an honor to be here. I love the Heartland Institute. Uh, I came across them in uh, Paris in December at the UN's Global Warming Summit, and we had a really good time there. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you guys about education, and uh, it actually meshes a little bit with the global warming stuff. You know, how did they convince people that the gas we exhale is pollution and that we need to pay a global tax to the UN? Well, this is how. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about what they've done in the schools and uh, how it got this bad. So. Uh, Dr. Sam Blumenfeld, he's the co-author of the book, and uh, he wrote, I think, 12 books on education. He really was the expert. He spent 50 years looking at this stuff. He went into the old archives, looked at the old correspondence, and he dug out just massive amounts of information that would have been lost to history otherwise. And he, uh, he stumbled across this uh, quackery in the teaching of reading. And when he saw that, he realized, okay, that's my life mission. They're dumbing down the kids so that they can't read, and I want kids to be able to read. Because if they can read, they can educate themselves, and they can even undo a lot of the damage that the schools have done if they have the capacity to read. If they don't, then, of course, they won't be able to do that. And I realize that sounds a little bit out there until you see what I'm talking about. This stuff has been known for 150 years. They just don't talk about it too much. Uh, so he passed away last year. 
Uh, wonderful, wonderful guy. Uh, if you want to read more of his books, I really encourage it. I've learned so much from, uh, from what he had to say. Here's a few of them. Alpha Phonics, I used it to teach reading to a four-year-old in about a month with very little effort. Uh, I mean, this is the way you teach reading, obviously. It's, it, it's effortless, it's so easy, and you have these government schools spending $200,000 to educate, supposedly, a child, and they're coming out and they can't read their high school diploma. Well, how come I could teach a four-year-old to read with a $15 booklet? It, something's obviously wrong here. Um, he's also got how to tutor, some instructions for math, all kinds of good stuff. NEA, if you want to learn about the, um, the National Education Association and what they've done to education, so much good stuff. Um, so we have a number of crimes that we identify in the book. Obviously, treason is the most serious, and uh, again, I realize that's a shocking claim to hear, that the education establishment is involved in treasonous activities. Uh, but what we show in the book, using primary source documents, is that the people who designed the education system we have today had in mind the goal of overthrowing our system of government and replacing it with a totalitarian system of government. And they said so themselves. So this is not you know, any kind of secret. And I think when you see what Ronald Reagan's commission had to say, maybe this claim will sound a little bit less stunning. Um, so we've got treason, we've got child abuse. Deliberately harming the mind of a child, we argue, is child abuse. And you know, this is not to talk about teachers. Like, I'm a teacher, and most of the teachers I know are wonderful people. They're doing what they can to educate the kids as well as they can. Unfortunately, they're in a bad system. But God bless them, they're doing the best that they can in the circumstances that they're in. There's a lot of good teachers out there, and none of the ones that I know have gone into education thinking, I'm going to dumb down the kids. That's what I want to do when I grow up, is dumb down the kids. Unfortunately, the system that they are operating in uh, operates in this way. So we have uh, contributing to the delinquency of a minor, you know, teaching uh, four-year-old sex education, which is what UNESCO recommends, the UN Education Agency. We argue that this kind of stuff contributes to the delinquency of a minor. And we've got, uh, I'm aiming this the wrong way. There we go. Uh, destroying belief in biblical religion. So believe it or not, and I'll show this in a minute, the schools in the United States were originally founded so that children could read, so that they could read the Bible. That was the purpose of education. So that actually they, so they wrote it right in the legislation so the devil couldn't come around and uh, trick ignorant people who didn't know the scriptures. But uh, nowadays, the Bible is totally banned from the school, and the schools do everything they can to destroy the children's belief in biblical religion. Uh, they use all kinds of different methods to do this. Uh, the pro-evolution propaganda is one of the biggest ones. And then, of course, the substitution with, uh, of Christianity with religious humanism. And this is not my idea. You'll see that these people actually talked about this. They wanted religious humanism in the schools, not Christianity. Uh, and then they push drugs, right? They mess up the kids and they say, well, you just need some amphetamines and that'll solve your problem. Uh, of course, that's hardcore drugs. If you were to do that outside of a, you know, a school setting, you would be arrested, and rightfully so. And uh, then we have fraud and extortion. Uh, you know, if you go to a businessman and you buy a product from them and they tell you it's going to do something and it does the opposite, you would say, hey, wait a minute, you ripped me off. I want my money back. You'd take them to court for fraud, for defrauding you. Well, that's exactly what the schools are doing. They're saying, give us lots of money. We'll educate your kids. And then what happens? The opposite of education, right? They're coming, down, they're coming out dumbed down without even the capacity to educate themselves. So uh, we go, go back to the treason that I mentioned at the beginning. It's a strong word, right? Uh, this is what Ronald Reagan's commission in 1983 had to say, and it's actually much, much worse, uh, the education system is now, than it was when Ronald Reagan's commission said this. But they said that if an unfriendly foreign power had tried to impose this education system on us, we might have considered it an act of war. So that's really serious language from a bureaucracy, right, from a government committee. Um, and we argue in the book that we shouldn't not consider it an act of war just because it was imposed by people who happened to have been born in the United States. Uh, and then they also said that this educational system threatens our future as a people and as a nation. So that's really serious stuff. And, you know, when you think about government bureaucracies, they're very rarely known for using um, incendiary rhetoric. But uh, this is what the commission had to say. And uh, Dr. Blumenfeld and I agreed wholeheartedly uh, with these comments. Um, so let's uh, just a quick history tour, uh, just to kind of give people some perspective here. Um, it wasn't always this way, right? Back hundreds of years ago, John Adams, he said, uh, he's quoted in a number of books, that a Native of America who can't read is as rare as a comet or an earthquake. So I think you'll agree that's pretty rare. It's, it doesn't happen much, right? Jefferson used to brag that American farmers were the only ones in the world who read Homer. Try to ask a kid coming out of a government school today about Homer and see what kind of answers you get. Um, the statistics that are available on literacy show that literacy was extremely widespread in early America. Even before the United States as a country was founded, 85% uh, could read in New England between 1758 and 62. 
in cities like Boston, it was almost 100% by the early 1800s. Um, we have uh, the National Education in the United States of America. This was a study published in 1812. They found that uh, just four in a thousand Americans in these areas would be unable to read and write legibly and neatly. Do you suppose we could do a survey today of children and find that just four out of a thousand couldn't read and write? It's, uh, it's incredible. So this is what it was like before we had this massive system that we spend a trillion dollars a year on. So what happened? How could it possibly have gotten that bad? Well, what we show in the book is that it wasn't an accident, actually. It w this is not just a kind of big national accident. We just woke up one day and said, oh, what did we do? <laughs> we wasted a trillion dollars a year, and we have this terrible education system that can't even teach the kids how to read. Uh, and so the reason we had this good education system, I mentioned this earlier, in 1647, one of the very first acts to do with education in the United States was the old deluder Satan Act. And uh, they said in the act that uh, one of the big projects of that old deluder Satan is to trick people. So everybody needs to learn how to read so that they could read the scriptures, right? That was the whole purpose of education back then. If you look at the materials, I've got lots of these materials that they used to use to educate the kids back then. It's amazing. The, just the content, the, the literacy, the scriptures, it's so amazing to see what they used to learn with back then. Uh, you know, and then go check out what they use today. So back uh, in early America, homeschooling was actually the norm, right? Most of the founding fathers were actually homeschooled. Some of them had tutors come around. Some of them had a little bit of formal education. And yet they knew Latin, they knew Greek, they knew the history of political systems, they knew science, they knew their Bibles, they knew economic thought. They knew all these kinds of things. And we didn't spend a trillion dollars on education. So, um, you know, if you think about the, the men who signed the Declaration of Independence, you know, these were extremely well-educated people, and they didn't have any kind of education system like this. So how did it happen? Well, there was just um, homeschooling, small local schools, and there was a very specific purpose, right? They had to learn their Bible. So today the Bible is banned. Um, literacy rates, even in, during the Civil War, 90% for Union soldiers, over 80% for Confederate soldiers. So, you know, Americans have always been very literate people. And uh, some of these statistics about present day, you probably won't believe. So I encourage you to go to the U.S. Department of Education's website. Look at them yourself. Now, uh, here's just a very small sampling. I could do this all day to show you how big this disaster is. In 1993, they found that half of American adults could barely read. And this was actually the headline in the big newspapers. Half of Americans are illiterate, right? It's in the, because this was from a federal study. Uh, then in 2003, they did it again. About half of Americans are barely literate. They, they classified them into five groups, five being really good, one being, you know, you can't really read a stop sign even. And uh, almost half of Americans were in the bottom two categories. Two was also, you know, almost functionally illiterate. Um, according to the State Education Agency, they did a report, two-thirds of Washington, D.C. residents over the age of 15 are functionally illiterate. So we spend tens of thousands of dollars every year on these students. Two-thirds of them cannot read when they get out of the government schools. Something is really wrong here. Mm. So, and it wasn't an accident. So that's what we show in the book. Um, you know, we could, again, we could keep going with this all day. Less than a third of students in eighth grade, according to the federal government, can read proficiently. So what happened? Did we all just become morons? How did, we can't read anymore? How could this have happened? Well, if you look at the SAT scores, you know, here's a very objective way to measure this. And what you find is about every 10 years, they have to recenter the test because Americans are getting dumber and dumber and dumber. We're spending more and more money and we're getting dumber to the point now where the smart kids back then, or the smart kids today are in many cases dumber than the dumb kids from the 1950s and the 1960s. And this is demonstrably true. You can look at the SAT scores and trace them through time and you can see just an incredible decline, but they recenter it every 10 years or so to kind of conceal the scale of this disaster. Um, I have a lot of old books from the turn of the century, from the early 1900s, late 1800s. And what you see is that, you know, kids from middle school back then were much better educated than a lot of the kids coming out of the universities today. And that's no exaggeration at all. Uh, here's some numbers, right? They'll say, oh, well, if we just had more money, we could solve this problem, right? Just give us more money. And, uh, you know, here's uh, the data. Cato Institute put this together. It's a good chart. So, you know, there's the blue in the cost of the education, so-called. And uh, down there you have the performance. And it's actually, uh, the performance I would argue is going down. I don't know exactly how they put this together, but um, you can see that spending more money on this is not gonna solve the problem, right? Um, let's see. 
So how did we get to this point? Well, we have Horace Mann. I'm going to have to speed through a lot of this because this was actually a, a little bit of a longer presentation and we don't have time to go through it all. But Horace Mann, he went to Prussia and he was a Unitarian and he thought, well, hey, let's equalize everybody. Let's set up government schools, make them compulsory like the Prussian government, and then we'll make all the kids love the state and you know we'll equalize them all so that the owner of the business and the worker in the business, their kids will go to school together. Well, isn't that nice? And um, he thought that uh, you know this would be very good and that it would promote morality and other stuff like that. Um, and again, he was a Unitarian, so he wanted to kind of get this um, Christianity, this doctrines of the Trinity. He wanted all that out of the schools, and um, so he pushed this idea. Now, one of his big ideas was this whole word method. He's the guy who really first pushed this. Now, I'll, you know, I'll start with a little detour. The guy who came up with this, wonderful guy, Reverend Gola. Uh, he had deaf children in his care. He was a reverend, and he realized, well, they can't learn to read using phonics because they can't hear the sound of the letters. So I'm going to try to teach them to read by letting them memorize the words. And for deaf kids, you know, that's, that's a very possible thing to do. But Horace Mann said, hey, that's wonderful. Let's put it in the schools here in Massachusetts for everybody else. And it was a massive disaster. If you want to have your mind blown, go and read the essay that the Boston schoolmasters put together criticizing this after it had been in the schools for a few years. It resulted in massive declines in literacy and widespread illiteracy. And so the schoolmasters got together and they wrote a scathing essay. It's like 30 pages depending on the size of the font. And um, it'll blow you away. I mean, it's a masterful debunking of this idea that we can teach children to read English as if it were Chinese. And really, that's what's going on here. These little pictures here, I think if you, if you see what's going on in the picture, that's a good illustration of what's happening. They're teaching the kids to read whole words as if the whole word itself was a symbol. As if, you know, in Chinese, you have a character that represents a word, an idea, whatever. So this is how they're doing with the whole language. They tell the kids, memorize this list of words. So they look at the word and they say, that little series of squiggly lines means cat or dog, rather than that squiggly line is a C and makes a K sound, and the, that squiggly line is an A and makes an uh sound. So this is actually what's going on in schools all across the country. As we'll see, it's part of Common Core as well. And it flies in the face of all logic. This was discredited back in the 1840s when Hor uh, Horace Mann tried to put it in the schools in Boston. So this is, it's not new that this is a dumb idea. This has been well known for a long time, more than 150 years. Um, so um, here's something, you know, it's a huge essay. I encourage you to read it yourself. But they said that such a, chain as proposed, such a change as proposed by Mr. Mann is neither called for nor sustained by sound reasoning. And they show that very clearly. This is not sustained by sound reasoning. Every possible argument you could make for teaching kids to read this way falls flat, unless they're deaf and they can't hear the sounds. Um, it produces dyslexia, and uh, you know, this is shown in many experiments, and in even neuroscience today backs this up. Um, and uh, we'll get into that a little bit more because it was resurrected. It was pulled out of the schools in Boston after Horace Mann tried it, after just a few years because it was so terrible. Uh, but it came back, and we'll see. And it's actually what happens in the schools today. But uh, Mann had a long-lasting influence on education in America. He persuaded state legislatures across the country to adopt this Prussian model, where you're going to force all the kids to go to school uh, and you know, create all these tax-funded schools that will teach statism and so on. And uh, by around 1900, this had spread pretty much all across the country. Uh, but you know, it, it wasn't a new idea that it would be dangerous to set up government schools. Um, John Stuart Mill, very uh, famous philosopher, he explained that uh, you know a general state of a general state education, so having the government teach the kids is um, you know a very dangerous thing, right? The state is going to mold them uh, and. Um, establish a despotism over the mind, right? So uh, these ideas have been around for a long time. There was a reason why we didn't have this massive network of government schools. Uh, but then Horace Mann succeeded. And then along came this guy, John Dewey, an educator, so-called a humanist, a socialist. Um, and you know, none of this stuff is a secret. You can go back and read his writings. You can see what his agenda was. He didn't hide it all that much. We've reprinted some of his essays in the book. Um, but he loved these mandatory schools, and he set out to hijack them. He wanted to fundamentally transform the United States from this, uh, he, what he considered to be an individualistic society with all these liberties and people only concerned about themselves, to a socialistic model. Uh, he told us what he wanted it to look like. This was a novel he thought America should look like. It was uh, Looking Backward by Edward Bellamy. And um, this was a communist uh, America. It was a fantasy novel about a communist America in the year 2000. 
And um, the idea was no private property, no God, no none of that, and we'll just all be good little collectivists and work together. No more of this profits and everything. We'll share everything, right? And in fairness to Dewey, he didn't have the last hundred years that we have. You know, he didn't see national socialism in Germany. Uh, he only saw the very beginnings of international socialism in Russia. He didn't see Cuba. He didn't see Zimbabwe. He didn't see North Korea. So, you know, in fairness, he, he didn't know necessarily that it would lead to mass death and starvation and horror and concentration camps. But, uh, you know, he should have known better. And he certainly shouldn't have used our entire country as an experiment to, you know, overthrow the system and replace it with this kookery. Um, but uh, his idea was, hey, let's reintroduce um, this method that man had brought about, this whole word method, and we'll use that to uh, kind of dumb down the kids. And he didn't say it in those words, but that was his agenda, and it comes through very clear. He actually went over to the Soviet Union, and he thought Lenin was doing a great job, right? That must take some, some doing right there. And uh, he wanted a new social order. And again, you can read all of his essays. Um, did we skip a slide? Yeah, he was a humanist. He was one of the signers of the first humanist manifesto. Uh, if you want to get an idea of his mindset, he was one of the architects of this manifesto. Go read the first humanist manifesto. Here's some quotes from it. Uh, the very first plank, religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. So if you think about everything that America was founded on, America was founded on this idea that God created us equally and that we all are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. So this is fundamentally incompatible with the ideas upon which America was founded. But this is the guy who ended up taking over the government school system. And if you talk to any college of education today, if you go on Wikipedia, they'll say this guy um, uh, is the founding father or the godfather of the American government school system. So it's, it's, you know, it's not hidden. Uh, they also said that at the time has passed for theism and deism, right? No more of that stuff. And we need to abolish the profit motive society, get rid of private property. So this was the first humanist manifesto. This is a product of John Dewey, the guy who designed our school system. Now compare it with, you know, the Bible or America, right? In, right in the beginning of the Bible, it says, in the beginning, God created, right? It wasn't self-existing. God created. And then uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So if the humanists take out the fear of the Lord from the schools, are they going to get wisdom? Well, <laughs> make your own conclusion, right? And then the Declaration of Independence, of course, says that uh, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. This is the whole idea that our country is founded on, and he wanted to overturn that. He wanted to get rid of the Christianity, get rid of the literacy, so that he could bring about this new social order where we wouldn't have private property, we wouldn't have individualism, we wouldn't have individual rights, we would all be shaped into this uh, collective, right? And he thought he was going to do the shaping, of course. Um, he was uh, an educator. You, know, here's, you can read quotes from his stuff. It's just amazing what his views on education were. It wasn't to teach kids how to think or to do uh, math and to read. It was to mold them and socialize them into being these uh, interesting collectivist creatures. And uh, he had this uh, essay. We reprinted it in the book, if you want to read it, uh, called The Primary Education Fetish. And he's like, what's with this having to teach the kids how to read and do math? You know, do we really have to focus that much on that? Why don't we worry about socializing them and making them good uh, collectivists who worry about the social order and all this kind of stuff? And uh, there's a quote from there that uh, I think I pulled out for the next slide. Here we go. Change must come gradually, because to force it unduly would uh, compromise its final success by favoring a violent reaction. So he knew that people would never go for this kind of craziness if he were doing it out in the open. So he tried to do it quietly and secretly. And he was very successful. He got a lot of money uh, from the Rockefellers. He took over some of the most prominent teaching colleges in America, uh, teaching college at the Columbia University, for example, one of the most prestigious so-called education schools in this country. Uh, he, with lots of money from the Rockefellers, they had the General Education Board was their philanthropy. He was able to take over all of this. And of course, once you take over the teaching colleges and you send out armies of teachers who will teach teachers who will teach children, you know, your job becomes much easier. Um, a key part of his plan was reintroducing this whole word method. So now that he was in control of all these teaching colleges, they started putting together materials to teach reading that were based on this kook method where you're going to teach the kids to memorize words. And again, this is still going on in schools across America today. That is why the numbers that I showed earlier from the federal government, um, that's why we have this situation, because they're teaching reading uh, in a ridiculous way. Uh, he also teamed up with a bunch of psychologists, and they turned the classroom into this psychological laboratory and experiment where they were treating children as circus animals. I mean, this is the philosophy that pervaded their ideas, this idea that humans are just biological response mechanisms, and uh, you need to just train them, right? We'll do kind of like Pavlov's dogs. Um, 
so he came up with the Dick and Jane reading program, the Macmillan reading program, all these different methods. Some of you might have learned with those. And uh, it's not to say that nobody can learn how to read using these methods. And in many cases, the kids who do use these methods, they have parents who've already taught them about phonics. You know, your parents uh, probably say, oh, you know, there's a P. What sound does a P make? So when, a lot of kids are able to escape a lot of the worst damage. But for the kids who go straight from nothing, into these whole word reading methods. They end up with dyslexia, they end up illiterate. You can only memorize so many words, right? It's just not a very efficient way of learning to read. Uh, that four-year-old that I told you about earlier that I taught with phonics over a month, uh, he reads the King James Bible now. He's six years old, so. Um, so, uh, yeah, now this stuff has been exposed many times, right? There's nothing new about what I'm saying here. I didn't stumble upon some discovery. Um, Rudolf Flesch exposed it in 1955. If you want to get your mind blown, read that book. He, he said, what are we doing here with the schools? I mean, people can't read because they're teaching to read this way. So, again, this wasn't new. Uh, Sam Blumenfeld put out uh, The New Illiterates, where he broke down these reading materials point by point so that you could understand what they were doing to the minds of the kids. Uh, Dr. Seuss told us all about this. The killing of phonics was one of the greatest causes of illiteracy in this country. Uh, and actually, Dr. Seuss was commissioned to teach kids sight words. All these little cute books that he wrote. You know, Sam, my co-author, said, how come kids are coming to me dyslexic before they even uh, have been taught sight words? Ah, he figured out it was the Dr. Seuss books because they're learning Sam, I, am. And so they're learning all these words by sight instead of actually learning how to read. Um, got, let's see. Huh, I wonder if I broke the remote. There we go. And so neuroscience now confirms this, right? There's a, we talk about this a lot in the book. There's a neuroscientist who's done brain scans now on the kids who have been taught to read the correct way and the kids who've been taught to read with the whole word quackery. And you can see very clearly the difference in the brain. It's messing up the minds of these young children. The education establishment knows this full well. Certainly, you know, the first or second grade teachers don't understand this, but this is well known now. You know, they can't say, oh, we were just ignorant. We didn't know what we were doing. The information is out there. Uh, and actually, this guy who did this research, he's a progressive. He, He's totally fine with government schools. He just says, hey, start teaching ki to kids to read the correct way. Um, so, again, this has been exposed first in 1844, but yet it's in Common Core today. Here's Common Core for kindergarten, their standards. It's, they're supposed to read common high-frequency words by sight. Right? So they give them lists to memorize. The Dolch words, for example, they have a, you know, a couple hundred words and the parents are supposed to drill them with the flashcards. And the poor parents don't realize how much incredible damage they're doing to their kids, unfortunately, by following the teacher's instructions. And you know, you like to think that, well, hey, the teacher knows what they're talking about. They know what they're doing. I should do what they say. Unfortunately, it does incredible damage to the children. And this is part of Common Core. And then UNESCO, the UN's education agency, also promotes this method. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about UNESCO. Here's an example of this, right? This is the sight words that they learn in kindergarten. So once you start learning like this, your brain gets into the habit of trying to read words by identifying the whole symbol rather than trying to break down the phonetic component. So this causes lifelong problems. That's why there's so many people today who won't pick up a book if their life depends on it. Why people don't read the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bible, any of the things that they need to be reading. Um, so uh, feds in the classroom, right, some information on how we got the federal government involved in the schools. Uh, I think a lot of you guys are familiar with that process. Then the Clintons helped bring about the national standards. Now we have uh, Common Core, right, Obama helped to impose this on all our states using tax-funded bribes. Uh, you know, you guys know the story. Uh, I actually know uh, both of the subject matter experts. They only had two subject matter experts on the Common Core Validation Committee. This was a board selected by the Common Core people. Uh, so, you know, these were people who presumably were very favorable to this idea in general. Both of them refused to sign off. Uh, I know them both. I serve on a board with them on U.S. parents involved in education. Great people. Um, Sandra Stotsky, she said this is going to reduce the uh, critical thinking abilities. We're taking out all the great literature. I'm not putting my name on this. I'm not approving this. And I've talked to her. She has no problem with national standards. It's the problem for her is that these are dumbed down, ridiculous standards that take out all the important stuff kids need to know. Uh, Dr. James Milligram, the mathematician from Stanford, he said, I'm not signing off on this. The only mathematician on this validation committee said this is going to dumb down the kids. The math is so confusing. This isn't how you teach math. Some of this is based on incorrect math. And so, of course, that's what we're going to roll out across the country in, uh, you know, 45 states officially and the other five it's working its way in. So, you know, that sounds logical if you want to dumb down the country. Otherwise, you know, who knows what they're thinking. 
Uh, so science and history, right? They're doing the same thing in the science and history. They don't call it Common Core uh, in science. It's actually the same people, the same organizations, Achieve Inc. and the National Governors Association. They have the next generation science standards. They need to know that human activities are contributing to deadly global warming and we need to pay a carbon tax, right? And they need to know that they came from uh, rocks, you know, rained on the rocks for billions of years and the rocks turned into slime and the slime turned into monkeys. And then you came, so your life is no more valuable than a goldfish. You know, it's you, you, you're your pet cat. Same difference. You know, there's nothing special. Um, then, of course, we have history, right? Uh, Dr. Duke Pesta, who runs the Freedom Project Academy where I teach, he did an informal survey with his students, and he found that most of them think that America invented slavery. You know, they don't realize that every country in the world practiced slavery, and America was one of the first to put an end to it and helped to put an end to it around the world. Yet America is the guilty one because that's the propaganda they're getting in school. That's what passes for history. Um, so UNESCO, this is the UN's education agency. This is the next big uh, problem for us, right? Common Core, you thought Common Core was bad? Wait till you see what UNESCO has in mind. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, this was founded for the purpose of world government. They said so. Julian Huxley, the first secretary general. Political unification in some sort of world government was his idea, was his statement. Even in 1949, they were putting out pamphlets saying that the schools need to combat family attitudes, right, and family values. Uh, so UNESCO has all kinds of global education programs today. They have training manuals that, again, uh, advocate the teaching to four-year-olds of things that I wouldn't mention in any company, much less in front of you nice ladies and gentlemen. Uh, go read them for yourself. This stuff will blow your mind, what they want to teach to your kindergarten age children and grandchildren. It is disgusting. Um, they also have a world core curriculum, believe it or not. Bill Gates has been a big participant with UNESCO. They signed a formal deal with each other. And they have this world core curriculum. It was dedicated to Alice Bailey. Uh, if you have some time and you want your mind blown, look into her. She founded the Lucifer Publishing Company, wrote a bunch of weird books. Uh, she said that these uh, ascended masters would take her over and she would write these books like Education in the New Age. And so this is who the standards are dedicated to by the guy who wrote the standards. It's uh, weird stuff. And uh, if you want to read through the standards, you'll have your mind blown again. Uh, the current head of UNESCO is an actual communist. And uh, Arne Duncan, Obama's education secretary for seven years, said UNESCO is his global partner in his global education agenda. Education is a weapon to change the world. And they're going to introduce the sustainability stuff into every component of the education system. Um, and so. Um, we have a lot more, but we don't have too much time. So I just want to get into briefly what we can do about these things, because obviously these are some really serious problems we're talking about here. Our population, our nation, is being dumbed down to the point where they're almost ready to willingly surrender their liberties. Right? This didn't happen by accident, and it didn't happen overnight. It took a long time to get here. So what are we going to do about it? Well, for one, we need to understand we're going to lose our country and we're going to lose our freedoms if we don't do anything. Right? And it's just that simple. I'm not trying to be alarmist. That's just what's going to happen. They're brainwashing the kids. They're dumbing down the kids. They don't know anything about their history. They can't even pick up a book and read it. So our country and our freedoms are gone if we don't do anything. Uh, the first thing I say you need to do is protect your kids from this and your grandkids and your nieces and your nephews. If you have kids in your life that you love, you need to get them out of the government schools now. You know, it's not to say that all the government school teachers are bad. They're not. A lot of them are wonderful. A lot of them are great people who love the kids, who love America, who love God. But they're in a system that is designed to dumb down the kids. So if you have kids in the government schools, get them out now. There's no excuse, right? If you can't afford a private school, homeschool them. If you can't homeschool them, give them to the grandparents to help. Do something other than leave them in the government schools. Um, you can do Freedom Project Academy, you know, not to, to be an advertisement for that. I teach there, but it's very cost effective. Some donors help us defray the cost. It's a great tool for parents who don't have the time or the ability to handle it all themselves. Uh, we've got to get rid of the Department of Education, right? So much of this is coming from Washington, D.C. It needs to go. Once we cut the head off, you know, then the states can go back to doing their thing. The local districts can go back to doing their thing. But so much of this evil is coming out of Washington, D.C. It needs to stop. And, you know, we don't need to start in Washington, D.C. We can start at the state level. We can tell our state legislatures, stop taking money from these people and stop doing what they say. You know, the reason they could impose Common Core was because of all the money they were sending. They say, you want money? You've got to do the Common Core. What the states didn't realize was that the Common Core will cost even more than the amount of money they're getting from the federal government. So this was a dumb deal from every way that you look at it. Why? You know, we can stop this kind of stuff. We've got to get back to control, local control of our schools. Uh, we've got to evict this religious humanism. And actually, Dewey called it religious humanism. The courts have found that humanism is a religion. And this is being taught to your kids in government school all day, every day. They're teaching your kids a religion. It's just not your religion, right? 
we got to get the Bible and God back in the schools. You know, Sam Blumenfeld, my co-author, he was Jewish. His parents were Jewish emigrates from Poland. He loved the Bible readings in his public school. He thought it was wonderful. If you're offended by it, walk out of the classroom. But we need God back in the schools, right? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What happens if you take out the Lord? Well, you're in big trouble. Uh, we got to educate ourselves on this, right? You can pick up crimes of the educators if you want, and there's tons of resources out there. So we need to understand the problem so we, that we can fix the problem, and we really do need to get busy. We need to pray. We need to get involved in state and local issues, and we need to turn this around. So uh, that's all I have. So thanks very much for coming, guys. As we get ready to get this, as we get ready to open up for Q&A, on your tables, there are two papers there. One that says, join us. If you want to be a member of Heartland, get more information from Heartland all the time. If you don't want to receive it, please fill that out. There's also a survey on your table. Please fill that out so we know how we've done. You can give some feedback, and I'll, I'll give feedback to Alex if you'd like as well, too. Um, the way we're going to do the questions, Kyle and Ariana will come around and ask questions. Wait till the microphone's in front of you because we're live streaming. And we actually have one question real quick online that I will start with. This is from Paul Slobodian. He's a doctor of education from New Bern, North Carolina. Education, co educator college pr professors are only focused on social justice and counterproductive techniques like new math and whole language. How do we change this? I know you've covered a little bit of that, but if you want to go in a little bit more depth. Well, I think money talks, right? If they don't have any students, they won't have any tuition, and then they won't be able to do this. So, you know, if you're a parent and you're thinking about sending your kid off to college, think very carefully about where you're sending them. Uh, you know, parents and, and communities need to know better than sending their children to go off to be indoctrinated. And at the same time, we as taxpayers have some say in this, right? Our universities, for the most part, are publicly funded. Why are we letting our tax dollars go to promote anti-American, anti-Christian, anti-human ideas in the school? You know, this social justice stuff is totally contrary to what our nation was founded on. Why should the American people who don't agree with this stuff have to fund it with their taxes? So as taxpayers and as parents, we can both, I think, have a, a very big impact on stopping this, but we need to get busy. We need to talk to our state legislators and say, hey, why are you sending all my tax money to these universities that are cranking out little Marxists? That doesn't make sense. Okay. Over here, please make sure you raise your hand so Ariana and Kyle can see you as well. Uh, candidate for state superintendent in Wisconsin, and your presentation was very, very good. Thank oh, you very much. Thank you very much. My question is, um, is that list in the book? The solutions? Uh, we, in the last chapter, we talk about a lot of these things. I think all of these things are in there, yep. Uh, so those will be in the last chapter. And I think we also outline uh, you know, some of the stuff to do with homeschooling, too, which I think is a very good solution for a lot of parents. But obviously, not everyone can do it. So uh, all that should be in there, yep. Thank you. Yeah, if you di didn't pre-buy a book, they're in the back for $20 as well. So OK, question over here, Ariana, right over here up front. See, after 30 some years, I have, well, I used Dr. Blumenthal's, the Blumenfeld's book, How to Tutor, for my children when they were young. But um, the thing that should be brought up, and uh, people need to get a little, uh, a little education on, is the pushback from the schools. Because when my kids were in kindergarten, how to tutor and then we we did a little bit of dick and jane and in that but the school people you'd go in there they'd stare daggers at me they couldn't stand it and i was corrupting the kids so i'm on some list i'm sure somewhere <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all the cool people are so. yeah <laughs> but then you know you'd mentioned rudolph fleisch and I, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, richard mitchell um, the underground grammarian who's long since passed, I would definitely say you'd be interested. He was a college professor in uh, New Jersey. He was exposing uh, what was going on a long time. Uh, the Graves of Academe is a wonderful book. So wonderful. I would highly recommend it. But thank you. Thank you. So. Yeah, and you're right about the, the pushback that some of the teachers gave. Because, you know, they, they spend four years in a teacher's college, and they teach them that, well, you know, this is how you got to teach the kids to read. And so, uh, you know, a lot of the teachers think they're doing the right thing. And, oh, pesky parents are getting in the way. What are you guys doing? But parents need to be firm about it. And there are a lot of good teachers. I, actually, some of my nephews uh, are in a school right now. And, they're, you know, the teacher's supposed to be teaching sight words. And secretly and quietly, she's doing the phonics. And the kids are learning to read really good. There's a lot of people like that across America. Thank goodness, because it's, uh, you know, a lot of people are learning how to read precisely because of well-educated teachers who are willing to, you know, very quietly buck the system. 
Make sure you raise your hands and keep it up to make sure they can see you. So I know we've got a question right here in front. Then I've got one online, and then we'll have another one right over here. Uh, Mr. Newman, most of your talk was with regards to reading. Do you want to make any comments about uh, math? My background is science and engineering. And back in the 50s, everything was manual. We, we got math drilled into us. And now the reliance on calculators and computers, the kids can't add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Yep, and you know, it, that's exactly a parallel to everything that I've been talking about about reading. Math is really so important just for understanding the world and for being able to analyze things and to get along in everyday life, but you're exactly right. They're dumbing down the math, and if you look at a lot of the materials that go along with Common Core, I mean, I hear this all the time, parents who are accountants, who are mathematicians, and they can't even help their second grader with their homework because they're supposed to do the math stuff in some ridiculous way that makes no sense. The kids start crying. Parents don't know what to do, and this is, again, deliberate. Again, it's not that we just suddenly woke up and we're all dumb and we don't know how to run an education system. It's that this was a deliberate thing. So we have actually some chapters in the book on math, um, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's extremely important. Uh, Dr. James Milgram has offered some really wonderful critiques on the math component of the Common Core system. So if you want to see how bad it's gotten, read what he had to say. And keep in mind, this is the guy that the Common Core people put on the validation committee. I mean, these, the members of this committee called themselves a rubber stamp committee. So, you know, they went out looking for people who they thought would lend their name to this, and he gave really some brilliant critiques of the math stuff. And it keeps getting dumber and dumber. You know, over the decades, they keep using dumber and dumber strategies to teach math, and it's absolutely essential that people understand that. So thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, on your tables is actually an example of how they're doing a third, that's a third grade math problem of, of subtraction and how they're actually using addition to actually teach subtraction right now. So another question here online from, a, from Jim Blocky. He's a public school teacher in Las Vegas, Nevada. Do you think it is possible to legislate phonics only in our schools at the local level? You know, I don't think it should be necessary, but I think local school boards should be saying, hey, you know, we got to get the whole word method out of the schools. Um, you know, look at the research that's been done. I think it's overwhelming. It's good. Even go back to 1844 if you want and look at what the Boston schoolmaster said. So, you know, now Common Core, the, a lot of the Common Core defenders will say, oh, well, we have phonics in the Common Core. It's true. They do have phonics in the Common Core. Uh, but they do that to deceive parents. I showed you guys the standard for kindergarten. They're supposed to be memorizing all these words. Once your brain is already conditioned to try to read by guessing at the words, by identifying words as symbols, you know, a little bit of phonics doesn't really help all that much. You might be, they call it using it as a clue and a attack skills. You're supposed to attack the word with clues like phonics. That's not how you learn how to read. You just learn how to read using phonics. So I think there is a role for local school boards and for state legislatures to say, hey, you know, you're dumbing down the kids. That's not going to work. We need to introduce proper teaching methods here. That's, you know, that is, if taxpayers are paying for the schools, we have a right to demand that proper teaching methods be used. I have a question. I have two grandbabies who, have, who are autistic, and my daughter has her in the public school system at the age of three and four. But how can I convince her that she can homeschool her children? Because I, I know they're getting, uh, they're not learning anything. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, the special needs is always harder for parents, but, uh, you know, there's, additional blessings there too and I, I would say the first thing to do is just show her what's going on in the schools you know just put together a, a little report on what's happening in the schools and I think once people I think a big part of the reason why this whole system continues is because people don't know what's happening there if parents knew what was going on in the schools I don't think a lot of them would tolerate this they would either yank their kids out or they would march down to City Hall or the local school board however it works in your state and say enough of this you fix this now or there's gonna be a problem uh, so I think the first step is just to show her what's happening in the schools. If you, if you got a copy of Crimes of the Educators, give it to her when, uh, when you're done. And I think she'll come away with a different perspective. Okay, we're going to Kyle right here, then we're going to Ariana, and then we've got two questions over here. Go ahead. Am I on? Oh, yes. oh thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, we ought to thank Heartland. You're doing a terrific job. This organization is really needed, so mm -hmm. thank you. I'm concerned that so many parents uh, care, but they're clueless. I'm concerned that uh, uh, teachers all over their national meetings, they, they feature people like Bill Ayers as their keynote uh, speaker. Um, I used to report to his father, so I know something about this. I'm concerned that 
mainline churches, um, even uh, many evangelical churches, are clueless about this. Catholics, too many Catholics are closing uh, a number of their good schools. And I've uh, worked as a layman in schools in Minneapolis, Chicago, and Kansas City in, in a big way. And what I hear over and over again is we need more money. Well, in Minneapolis schools today, they're spending $21,000 per kid. And the kids are still, uh, half of them are dropping out. So how do we reach, uh, do a better job of reaching our churches and getting our churches, our religious community on, on board again? Thank you. You know, that is really so important what you just hate on. I, I think it's, it's so important that the pastors and the churches wake up to this. If you look at the numbers, it's very clear that the kids coming out of the schools are leaving the churches. So pastors, for your own survival, for the survival of your church, you need to take an interest in this. Uh, I, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get to it, but I have some slides on it. The schools are now using very advanced methods of manipulation to take the children away from Christ and from the church. If you look at the values clarification, for example, uh, I mean, they use these advanced, uh, it's actually psychotherapy, believe it or not, um, on the children. And, you know, the kids don't know any better. And I can give you, you know, some examples of the type of scenarios they use, and they, they call this education. Is they tell the kids, get into little groups. And now imagine that, uh, you know, your plane went down and you're in a life raft, and the life raft only holds uh, eight people, but you're nine people in the life raft. Uh, you have this kind of person, this kind of person, this kind of person. Which one are you going to throw out and kill? You know, and you're starting from the premise that you have to kill someone. So what this does to the kids is, oh, everything my parents taught me about right and wrong is wrong. You know, in this case, it's right to kill someone. The teacher said so. We've got to save the rest of us, so we've got to throw someone overboard and kill them. You know, why not give the kids an exercise, like figure out how you're going to save the extra person who doesn't fit in the raft? You know, maybe you guys will take turns swimming alongside. Maybe you, you know, throw a rope. There's all kinds of stuff you could do other than killing someone. And you know, they have all variations on this exercise, you know, the nuclear shelter. You're in a nuclear bunker, and there's been a nuclear war, and there's only supplies for eight people, and you're nine people. Which one are you going to throw out to go die in the you know, nuclear holocaust? Well, you know, we don't need to think like that. We'll just each eat a little bit less food, right? It, but this is the kind of manipulation that's going on in the schools, and it's very deliberate. Pastors need to understand this because the kids who are going through the schools, they're not going to come back to the church. They're going to, you know, become religious humanists, which was Dewey's idea. So, you know, as for how we reach the pastors, I think, again, information and education is the key. If pastors knew this was going on in the schools, they would be raising awareness among their congregations. A lot of them, you know, they don't want to offend people. Oh, I know some of you guys have your kids in public schools. I don't want to come down on you, but this is really important. And you're right, you know, a lot of the Catholic schools are also closing. Uh, you know, some of them are even adopting the Catholic version of Common Core. So, you know, all the churches, Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, all of them, they need to understand what's happening here. They're teaching the kids a religion, and it's not the religion of the overwhelming majority of the American people. You know, 70%, 80% of Americans and say they're Christians, and yet the schools that we pay for with our taxes are spreading a different religion. You know, why? With the Heartland Institute, um, I have a five-year-old five uh, son in fifth grade in public school, and just today his teacher had to send all the parents home the Math Expressions Common Core book so we can help our children with their math homework because we don't understand it. I look through the first three pages of this book and I still don't understand it. <laughs> Before Common Core and they started doing this, my son was in fourth grade, but at a fifth grade math, he's in fifth grade and is still at a fifth grade math. Because of the Common Core there, he doesn't understand why three plus three takes four different <laughs> steps and it's slowing him down. So, and you had mentioned that parents aren't involved. Every kid in at least my son's class, when we have our parent-teachers meeting, talk about this so they can explain it to us so we can help them. So p parents are involved, but. That's good. It, that's actually not true at all schools. A lot of the schools, and, it, and now they're moving a lot to this digital technology too because they don't want the parents to see the books. You know, they want to give them very controversial material and they don't want them to take home a worksheet so that their parents say, you're learning what in school? But, uh, you know, it, it's, of course, a lot of parents are more involved than others. Some parents don't get involved at all. Some parents are very involved. Uh, it's good if parents stay involved. But, uh, you know, I think the problem that you talked about that you don't understand this uh, book they're using is something that parents all across the country are facing. And, uh, you know, if, if you look at the numbers, people don't like Common Core. You have to wonder how they were able to keep this in there despite all the opposition. And, uh, you know, I think the problem she brought up is, uh, is a good illustration of that. 
What do you want? You want me to speak? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, Alex. Um, hi. I need, a little, I need you to help me a little bit about here with uh, history. And in particular, I'm talking about the history of the relationship of federal government to the education system generally along the United States. Okay. Um, my view of it, my understanding was that it really happened in a big way during the Carter administration with the creation of the Department of Education, which I think we all agree should be abolished and yeah. never should have happened. But, <clears throat> but what you're telling me about guys like uh, Dewey, and I, I'd heard of Horace Mann before, I've read some stuff about this. Can you uh, tell me a little bit about when did it really go off the rails? Was it Department of Education, Carter, or, or, or has the federal government been mucking around with this, this you know, uh, standardizing or uniformizing, <coughs> you know, American education from a federal top-down method? Good question. I, I would argue that it's been getting progressively worse, and, and I trace really the origin of this to Horace Mann because he set up this, you know, Prussian system that was really designed ultimately for statism. Uh, but, you know, back then the kids were still getting what we would consider today a fantastic education. They could read, they could write, they knew math, they knew history, they knew all kinds of stuff. Uh, Dewey took it to the next level where it got much, much worse. And then when the Fed started getting involved, actually they, they even started getting involved uh, much more in the 60s. Um, they passed different bills that said, oh, we'll give schools funding for, you know, different things, it, just a little bit, and that was the camel's nose under the tent. Then Carter came along with support from Congress, started the Department of Education, then it got really bad. Now, you know, we're at the point where the federal government has uh, manuals and guidelines for, you know, what gender should use which bathroom and, you know, which authors should write the textbooks and that kind of stuff. So now the federal government micromanages everything, and now we have gotten to a point where, you know, I, I don't think we can call it even an education system anymore. There wasn't a lot of federal money going into local, statewide. Right. That really started in the 60s. Um, they, they passed uh, the uh, ES, what was it, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And uh, that's, that was the camel's nose under the tent. They said, oh, we're just going to send a little bit of federal aid. We're not going to control your schools. Just a little bit of money. And then once they got the money, they got the hooks in. And they said, okay, you want the money, then you got to do what we say. We need to go real quick here. We'll have one question right here in the front and then one here, uh, right here. And sorry, we're, it will be, we'll be able to ask separately, personally, uh, afterwards, but we need to get finished up here. So, My name is Reverend Rita K. Lochner. I, am I the only ordained minister in the room? I want to speak to some of the... Um, There's one back there. Okay, some of the comments you've made about the church and pastors. Um, our particular church has uh, a Christian preschool. And I feel that that's one of the things that some of the evangelical churches or mainline churches are doing to help the children get a leg up even before they get into elementary school, starting at age two or three. Um, secondly, the, the comment that you made about... Um, go on, take another question. I just <laughs> lost my next point. Uh, just to speak to that real quick, I think that's wonderful. There's a lot of churches that are doing that. Actually, my church does that. They have a program for preschoolers, and that's a really good way to, you know, if you can do the kids an amazing amount of good just by teaching them phonics before they get, uh, you know, this other damaging stuff. I was going to make my point about the Catholic Church. Um, to my knowledge, yes, they are ch closing a lot of uh, churches in Chicagoland. And to my knowledge, I don't know Catholic churches that are doing the preschool education but a lot of other churches are and I think that's one of the things that the church is doing to help in terms of the, 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 the education. The other thing is the question about the homeschooling um, I think better than trying to convince your daughter I think you say can I help start homeschooling your children, my grandchildren because trying to convince There's a little bit of distance. Yeah. yeah. I mean I wish I could, I, I would be honored to do that because I homeschool my own children. Yeah and so did I. Part, part of the time. As you know, Alex, I'm your neighbor lady, and our children went to the Christian school. Paca, but the, yeah. the Christian school uh, in, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, was not all that better in educating than graded school, the, the international foreign school. And so I think schools are only really as good as the individual teachers, which you also said today. 
and I think that education is very individual. Mm -hmm. Every person learns in a different way, yeah, and the parents have to stay very tuned in to how their child is learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good comment. Okay, one more Thank final you. question over here. Alex, see you again. You too. Uh, I met you at the Project Freedom last year, yeah. and uh, do you live in Wisconsin? No. I was okay. up there just to give a speech and a couple other things, so yeah. Such a life. Yeah. <laughs> um, my question is, does the United States pay the bulk of UNESCO's budget like they do with the UN? Actually, I have really good news about that. Right now, we pay none of their budget. Um, they, uh, th th there was a law passed by Congress, actually signed by Bill Clinton, that said uh, that uh, if any UN or international organization accepts uh, I think it was phrased a non-state as a state member, then funds immediately get cut off. So that happened with UNESCO. They approved the state of Palestine as a member and kind of went around Israel and the United States. And so then the budget got cut off. So whatever the reason, we don't pay for them, thank goodness. Ronald Reagan actually took us out of there. He said this is a nest of anti-American communists and dictators and Islamists. We don't need to be part of that. And um, so that's, that's really good news. But Obama wants to rejoin and he wants to send them lots of money that we owe them from the past. So that's, that's not good. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's give Alex a round, another round of applause. Oh, thank you guys so much. Real quick to, quick to close up, if you haven't bought a book, please do so. Alex will be able to go to the back and be able to sign, uh, autograph your books, make a line back there. If you want to donate to Heartland, there's the dip jar in the back or the envelope on your table. Um, please hand your surveys to a staff member or leave it on your table. We'll come around and pick it up. Next Wednesday night, we are having the uh, movie night, the call of the entrepreneur right here. So you can come watch a movie after the election and commiserate whichever way you want with everybody else, depending on how the election turns out. In two weeks, we will have an election wrap-up with Joe Walsh and Dan Prof, both host on AM560, The Answer. That event will not be held here, though. It'll be held at the European Banquets here in Arlington Heights. So make sure you sign up. Make sure you have get your emails and look for the address. Um, it's out on Algonquin Road, but it'll be way too more, many people to fit in here. So, so that's November 16th. So thank you all for coming out on this rainy night and the seventh game of the World Series. And go Cubs! <laughs>